Well, hello everyone. Phil here again for another Talk and Tie live event, and you probably recognize the handsome stud to the to my right on the screen. Anyway, Ryan, he's my moderator to keep me honest and uh, keep me on track. So tonight, um, well, first of all, Ryan, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, buddy. Where you I'm been? Have you uh, been fishing? We'll just talk a little bit. Let everybody get on board. Um, yeah, well, uh, we were fortunate enough to finally get out and film a vlog uh, last week, yeah, we was were. it? Hey, we, we yeah. were able to entice some fall Stillwater rainbows. Uh, no rhyme or reason to what they were eating, but that greasy blob did the trick, didn't it? <laughs> well, there was some micro-leech action, too. So it was, there was a little micro-leech action, It was too, pretty yeah. good, but I think our season here, where we are in... I call this central Alberta because there's a lot of there's a lot of area north of us, but um, I think we're pretty well close to done. So and frozen. Yeah. So so yeah. All right. Well, tonight we're going to talk about um, we call it head turner flies because um, both Ryan and I are um, we uh, work a lot with Kent Govett from uh, Canadian Lama, and he brought in these new beads that he was pretty excited about, and and uh, we got some from him and and. I don't know about you, Ryan, but I'm pretty excited about them too because uh, I don't think I may ever tie a traditional balance fly ever again. <laughs> I know. I'll probably still end up in Michael's for some materials, but not for sequin pins ever no. again. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. So, yeah. So, some of you may have seen uh, I um, um, featured, I just uploaded a new um, uh, video for after a while onto my tying channel. Uh, finally get able to get behind the camera again with the crazy world we've been going through for the last year and a half. And uh, so I, I uploaded a um, um, a uh, video on my uh, YouTube channel, um, Todd o a, a mini version of Todd Oshie's uh, uh, Vampire Leech. And, and thanks to everybody who's watched it and to those who you subscribed. If you're not, go over to my YouTube channel and give it a watch. You'll see how, it's go how this uh, all behaves, but it's all... Uh, uh, we're going to do it all again here tonight. Uh, we're going to tie at least two patterns. We're going to try and keep this to an hour because we're sensitive to everybody's time and, and precious. And uh, please put your questions in. That's part of Ryan's job. He'll pop those questions onto the screen, and we will try and uh, get to them as many as I can. And then um, for those of you who have to check out early uh, or can't stick around for the whole broadcast, don't worry. This is being recorded and will be available after the broadcast both on my Phil Rowley Facebook, Phil Rowley Fly Fishing Facebook channel and Facebook page rather, and my YouTube channel as well. So it'll be a video there once it's loaded up. So, and it's, it's great to see some friends on there, Bob Vanderwater, who helps me film my uh, tying uh, videos and Steve Dexter. Good to see you, Steve. And uh, I see Keith's there. How's everything down your way? We've got people, Scott Sned and wow. I used to work with St Scott years ago. Mr. Tatarchuk is there. Everybody. We got, Aggie we got Aggie joining us too, Phil, and our wow. good buddy Trev. Yeah. Yeah. And word of Richard everybody. Linden. Richard Linden, um, if you read the intro to my uh, latest book, Richard's the one that got me into fly fishing after I used to play hockey with him. Hey, I'm uh, just going to throw that question up there just to stir the pot a little bit, Phil. What's the, where do I get that shirt Ryan is wearing? Um, I don't know because Phil doesn't have one. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get going. So what are um, you know what are what are tungsten head turner beads? Well, they're a, a bead, and I've got one here. I'll dig it out and uh, we've, we'll put it up on the other camera. But they're kind of a teardrop shape. Um, they come in um, different colors: uh, coronamid brown, um, black nickel. Gold, copper, chartreuse, and hot orange. I think I got them all correct. And uh, they're available in 764 and which is about um, three millimeters, and then 3.5 millimeter or 1 8 beads. And I'm just going to try and put this uh, on the other camera. So I'll just switch over here and you can see what these beads um, look like. So there they are right there. I'll turn a better light on. I'll just sort of spin them around. What's important if you notice, and I, I've got to watch here because Murphy's Law, yep, I knew it, would have it fall right off. Um, I'll just stab it back on the dubbing needle. But the part of the bead right here by my finger, if I get it on camera, 
that's there's two sides. There's kind of a vertical side on this side and a concave side on this side. And that's important because it's that concave side. Um, let's see, that's the other side on the, um, the pin side. But you'll see it when we tie. When you position that out forward over a hook eye on a jig hook or a scud hook or a standard shank hook, probably I haven't tried it on a slightly 1XL or 2XL hook, it will tip the fly horizontal provided you use, and it's most important, a uh, an improved clinch knot. That's that's the key, is the clinch knot. If you use a non-slip loop knot, it'll sort of hang maybe more on a diagonal, but when you tie it with a clinch knot, and, when, and I'll show you on camera, when you cinch that knot, instead of cinching it vertically if it, um, like this, you tip it a little bit, sorry, I'll go on camera this way better, a little bit back towards the bend of the hook, let's say at about an 11 o'clock position, Ryan, and then it'll hide vertically. So um, that's the key to these flies. So what you've got here is a bead that could A, turn any fly into a balance fly pretty well, allow you to fish that fly in a traditional cast and retrieve manner, you know, using, uh, instead of hanging it under an indicator, casting and stripping and retrieving. Um, and you can also balance a wide variety of hooks. In the past, you know, we used to, and I'll just bring this up and I'll put it on camera. This was how we had to balance flies. And it's still a great way. You know, I jokingly said I perhaps never do it, but I, I of course I will. Um, but I'll just, let me just put that up on, on the screen here so everybody can see it. But that is how we used to traditionally, how we traditionally balance a fly. Take a, um, it used to be done with, you know, when Jerry McBride, the originator of this whole concept down in Spokane, Washington, uh, and, and his members from the Inland Empire Fly Fishing Club, originated this concept it was on a down eye hook and the trouble with a down eye hook is when you're tying the fly if you're not careful you're going to bury that hook eye in amongst all the materials on the fly and you'll have a wonderful balanced fly and you just won't be able to tie it on those are the ones i give to ryan so he's got balanced flies but he, he we all know he steals my flies let's oh, be yeah, honest sure. yeah definitely um but what i my contribution to the whole balanced fly equation was using a jig hook and I often get asked um, if that makes a difference, 60 or 90 degree uh, jig hooks, and it really doesn't. The, the whole reason of the jig hook is simply so when you finish the fly, there's a hook eye that's exposed that you can tie onto. So it could be a 90 degree jig hook. It could be a 60 degree hook, jig hook. That doesn't matter. But the beauty of the, um, the uh, tungsten head turner beads now is the fact that we can now put them on jig hooks as well. So that's the first fly we're going to tie. And Ryan, these are just great. And I'm just getting the stuff ready here. So I'm going to tie a, a, one of my favorite patterns. I use it, I've used it a lot this fall. And that's my standard baby leech. It's on uh, my YouTube channel, uh, tied on a jig hook with a slotted bead, which is still a very effective way to do it. But I'm going to tie um, this fly on a number 12 uh, my favorite jig hook, a Daiichi uh, 4640, very stout, strong hook. I, I took this hook to Argentina with me, and it survived the, the fish down there. So I'm just going to get this started and flip over to my other camera, and Ryan can pop those questions up and keep me on track and, and generally just herd me around. Hey, Phil, you mentioned uh, tying these on with uh, improved clinch or with a clinch knot, mm -hmm. but when we were out last week, I had one of these off of one of those 90 degree Daiichis that you have there. Yeah. Um, and I, and I did use a non-slip new loop once the wind picked up and, and it really undulated and moved really nice. It didn't well, balance completely perfect, but yeah, uh, it sure did move nice. And I think that's a key too, Ron, you made a good point. I think sometimes get people when they do, especially in air balance, you know, where you're balancing, you know, off the vice in the air, um, that doesn't look level to me. So, um, it uh, people get worried it doesn't balance perfectly horizontal and there's really no need to worry about that. I'm just getting a thread started here um, because um, as Ryan pointed out, especially if there's a little bit of wind to help animate the fly and bounce it around, um, you know, that fly isn't going to, um, it's, it's not an issue. Um, it's not sitting in still water where it has to hang horizontally. And, you know, I don't think a fish comes screaming up to the fly and, says, oh, that's not perfect. You know, they don't have laser levels down there. But what's important about this, the way I tie this one is when I put the bead on, just slid it right on. This is the 764 for the number 12. Um, you could use, you could probably use, certainly use a 1 8 It'd be a little heavier. You know, I try to keep them as light as I can. 
um, because with the level leaders, I like to use my indicator systems. A, a lighter fly is just easier to cast. But this bead, I'll just pull it back a little bit with my thumb and forefinger here, my beat up thumb and forefinger. Um, it's upside down, but you can see this concave side of the bead. That's the side we're going to push forward and get that weight out in front, out over the hook eye. And we just get that in, get our thread started, and then push that bead um, just so it doesn't bounce around and get out of position and just build some thread. I'm just using my thumbnail right against the back of the bead and letting that thread um, slide down my thumbnail and, and get that bead locked in place. And then I'll just put a base layer of thread. And I'm just using black. Any black thread will do. Get that all the way down just so I have a good base to tie my materials on. And then I'm going to come back up. And for the tail. Hey, Phil. Some... Uh, yep. Trev, Trev, Trev's got a question about the, yep. uh, the clinch knot. Um, yep. He's asking how often do we have to move the clinch knot back to keep that fly balanced. And uh, you know, I'll let you take that one away. You know, that's a, a great question. question. Um, what I typically do is, is I always check it after I catch a fish and just make sure it's seated properly. Just quickly drop it over the side of the boat, have a look. And if I'm happy with how it's hanging, it's back in the water again. And every once in a while, if I'm not catching fish, where have I gone? Um, oh, there I am. There you go. Um, <laughs> that was scary. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I might check it once in a while, but for the, and again, even if it's sort of hanging on a little bit of an angle, I still think that's okay. It's still going to work. Um, yeah. And then, then Trev's next question is, do you think get the same wiggle with a clinch uh, as opposed to a loop knot? And I mean, you probably don't, but probably in don't. our experience, in our experience, I don't think we've noticed that it mattered. No, it, it hasn't. That, that's true. It's 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 not been an issue. Um, you know, I'd like to think my successor failure isn't hanging on <laughs> whether my flies wiggling or not. Um, what I'm going to use for the tail is, you know, most times um, micro leeches, marabou is a popular material, but it's a little thicker. This is a schlap and feather, a rather beat up and useless one. But what I like is the the flu or the fluff the stuff we most of us throw away right on the base of the feather so on this side you can see how this is kind of this isn't much use so what i've done on this side of the feather is simply stripped it away down here and i'm going to take basically almost right up until where it gets into the main meat of the feather that we typically use and i'm just going to come in pull those stems up that more or less aligns them and then just strip and roll. So I pulled, stripped a little bit off. It's hard to see on camera. I'll go behind here and then roll it down. And what I end up doing is just rolling a clump like this. Remove that from the the uh, the feather. Sorry, the you know the main part of the feather, the stem. And then I'm going to tie this in as a little tail, about about the length of the shank, from the sort of the top of the bead to the bend. If there's a few errant fibers that aren't quite up to length, we can certainly pinch those. But I do have a preference for not tearing my tails to length. I just like the, the natural taper of the of the fibers in there, just um, believing they move a little better in the water. So I'm just going to push this up near the bead, take a one loose wrap, two loose wraps, then I'm going to add tension. And by doing that, by when I do it that way, um, I completely envelop the material with thread. So when I finally apply, apply tension after that second wrap, basically all the tension is going to, um, come on that material from all points on the compass from 360 degrees. I got a few minor long ones here, but I'll just pinch them to length and that's good. And I usually often just moisten the tail just to keep it out of the way. Now I'm going to put a little bit of flash in the tail. And to do that, um, well, I was going to use some crystal flash, but I don't seem to have it. So we won't be using it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then the next part, I don't know where the heck I put the crystal flash. That's typical. Hey, hey, Phil. Yeah. Brian yeah. Kemkis, I hope I'm saying that right. He's yeah. uh, asked if he noticed if the 90-degree hooks pick up more weeds and scum more than the 60-degree hooks do. No, I've never encountered that. Um, never at all. Um, no, you know, we, fishing... we find that... Go ahead. I think we find that the 90-degree hooks with these tungsten head turner beads balance a little bit truer yeah. than uh, with a 60-degree. And the 90 degree, it gives you a little more space to tie in. So you're not hiding that eye of the hook, but um, yeah. Yeah, because scum. I, I, yeah, Brian may be referring to if we're casting and retrieving, 
Um, yeah. Both ways, this fly is going to ride upside down because the weight is, you know, when this thing's sitting up, the weight is on the top side of this hook, which is going to cause it to roll under, right, and ride hook point up. So when it's under an indicator, it rides upside down. And when we're casting and stripping, basically you've made a neat little jig. So usually I put a little bit of crystal flash in the tail, a strand of red or a strand of pearl or UV pearl I prefer, but I don't know where the heck it's gone. It's probably on my tying bench. So what I'm going to do now is what I like to do with this fly is to build the body. And you can certainly build a dubbing brush, you know, um, up, you know, prior to tying in. But I'll just show you sometimes when I'm in a pinch, I just do it right on the fly. So what I've tied in is a, just a loop of small olive uh, ultra wire. And, of course, everybody's wire always looks like this, right? <laughs> kind of That's a funny up. color. That's a funny color, olive, Phil. Blue. You meant blue, <laughs> blue ladies blue. and gentlemen. Did I say blue, olive? Uh, I'm staring That's at all right. the things. Okay, so I, what I've done is I've tied in this loop of uh, blue wire, and then I'm going to use um, some, air, you know, my favorite color for this, it's a bruised color, is that black-blue Arizona Simi Seal. And I've just taken a little clump out of the bag, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of pull it apart back and forth a couple of times just to break it up because it's often stuffed in there by hand and gets kind of clumped up. I just want to free it up. So I've got that prepared. And then I'm going to take uh, my dubbing twister and lots of different ones you can use. You could use a weighted one. This is uh, Dr. Slick. It's got a weighted end on it. What I tend to use most often is this cow bird style. It's like a crochet hook on it, but it's got no weighted end. So what that allows me to do is really just control the twist. If the dubbing loops longer, like oftentimes it's a little awkward, but if I'm doing a bunch of these flies and I, you know, I haven't pre-made the dubbing brush, I will make like a 12 inch long wire loop. It's really awkward to twist up. So the first fly is a little uh, awkward, but of course I trim that loop off and I've got another loop, for perhaps two or three more flies. So so what I've done is I've put a little pinch of the uh, Arizona Simi Seal in, sort of out of focus here at the bottom of the loop, and I push it right up till it almost touches the fly. And then I come in, I just pick, there you go, I pulled the wire out. Only when you're demonstrating on camera does this stuff happen. Looks like a bunch of fly tires on here, Phil. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry about it. I think we all do that at the back. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, if that happens, a way to obviously uh, beat that is... Uh, I deliberately tied it in with the tag ends. Um, they're sitting right here. Uh, tag ends long, fold them over. I don't know what my camera's doing, flipping on and off like that, but I'm not touching it. And then we'll just bring that up. So what I did is I flipped it in and over, and that should really lock the wire in. So again, I've got the wire loop. I put the dubbing tool in, and we just start a good review. of So a pinch, very sparse. Right, because first of all, we don't, I don't like, even if I was using a thread loop, I would not load it up very heavy, you know, with a lot of dubbing. I want the dubbing to brush out. I want those fibers to have freedom of movement so they'll breathe and flow. Um, but also, one of the reasons for the dubbing loop uh, out of blue wire is so it, it complements the color of the dubbing with the little blue highlights in it and kind of shines through once it gets wet and just gives the fly sort of a little inner attractive glow. I might be overthinking this thing. It probably is, but it's worked for me. And as I often say, I quote Kevin Costner out of Bull Durham. For those of you who remember that movie, you never mess with a streak. That's right. And now hey, I've got uh, the Phil, loaded up. Yep. John, John Wilkinson's got a question here. Uh, do you find that tails on jig hooks don't tangle as much in the bend as they do on a standard hook? Uh, it's possible, but the next fly I'm going to tie, I'll show you, if you tie your tail in, and this, the fly I'm going to tie does have a long tail, it's, uh, if you tie down into the bend with the marabou, um, it tends not to foul as much. So as, as opposed to, um, um, not tying it straight off the bend, come down a little bit, it really, it, you won't notice it's imperceivable, but it just tends to foul a little less. But these definitely, uh, you know, these short tails don't foul at all. So what I've done is I spun this up, and then very gently I'm going to take my dubbing brush and just stroke it like this. I'm doing it gently because I've already had one disaster already, minor disaster with the wire. But if I'm too aggressive, uh, obviously I'm going to break the wire. And if that happens, you would just tie it back in and 
Now, you, you, as though you were tying in a dubbing brush. So what I want to do is I just, I want to get all this um, dubbing freed up. Take any of these little clumps out. Get down to the core so that has a chance to sort of show through once it gets wet. And then basically I've turned this into a little bit of a hackle. So now I'm just going to take my uh, uh, dubbing noodle here, my wire brush, my dubbing brush that I've made. And I'm just going to put one complete turn around the base of the tail and then use my left thumb and forefinger to stroke those fibers back as though I was winding a hackle. I mean, hey, Phil, is that point. small wire or extra small you're using? It's just small. I wouldn't... I. You could probably use the extra sp small. I generally don't because I'm a little heavy handed, as you've seen, and I just worry I'd pull it right out. I don't think it, it makes that much of a difference. And of course, the other benefit of this wire loop is that the fly is bulletproof, very, very durable. So I'm just going to wind that in as tight as I can. Come in over the top a couple of times, a couple in front. And then I'm going to use the backs of my scissors or if I got another pair here of Dr. Slicks, one of the things they have, no, don't have the ones. On some of their scissors, they have a, actually a little, um, right in the back of the scissors is a wire cutter. But I just use the back of the wire to cut that off. And that's basically done. And then you can add some, um, as you've probably seen on other videos, I like to add the glue right at onto the thread as opposed to trying or the adhesive, or in this case, I'm going to use some uh, UV resin. Uh, if I tried to dab it right in here, there's a pretty good chance I'd mat up um, all the dubbing fibers, which is the last thing I want to do. So I'm just coating. This is solar res um, bone dry. I'm just going to pull this back, moisten my fingers a little bit, pull the back of the bead back. This gets whatever you're using to adhere the fly right in at the tie off point. And then you could probably just cure it and cut it, but uh, a little paranoid. So I'll just give a three to five turn whip finish. Dragging the fly all over the place here. And then come in, trim that off. And then I'm going to aggressively brush this fly. Like, I mean, I just, and I tr tend to sweep the dubbing forward to really pull it out. And then I would stroke it back and let it flow. And the fly is basically done. The only other step I would do after this is a little hair styling. And, and to hairstyle the fly, I would dip it. I don't have it, happen to have it handy here right now. You know, if you've got a few errant fibers, it doesn't really matter. But what you're going to do is take this fly, sneak upstairs, or and take a cup of glass of hot water, and nuke it for a, just about a minute. And that'll bring it to near boiling. And then you're going to dip the fly into um sorry into the uh that hot water and uh then that's uh, going to uh um flow those fibers and then they'll style for you okay so that's the the baby leech it's uh it's a, a really deadly pattern it's one of my favorite searching patterns um to use particularly in the fall months it just works so well for me. i have you know if people often ask me what do i start with and this is the fly i start with is is the baby leech so any is there any other questions ryan before we move on or yeah we've got a couple here um so what do you here's one here from shannon wood so what do you suggest for picking a bead that actually fits on a pan's fish style hook uh i know you and i have yeah, I'm talking with Kent about getting some smaller ones of these tungsten head turners made if possible. Yep. But um, yeah, that would be uh, the um, like a three thirty second or two point eight millimeter. I think it always seems to vary on the millimeter side. It's kind of ironic, Ryan, that in Canada we are a metric nation, and yet we still refer to our bead sizes uh, in fractions. And yet many of my American friends are all in the millimeters, and I'm arguably lost a lot of times. Like, what's that in fractions? So. Kind you, of where we you, and, a bit. you and I both. We got another one here. Uh, Ixter Booth, I'm in Edmonton. Is there any local to get these offset beads? No, um, there isn't. But uh, Phil and I both pro tie for Canadian Llama. Yeah. Um, and that's you can order them through Canadian Llama's website. Uh, they're excellent there. Um, the great, customer great service turnaround, is great top. Service. Yeah, it's amazing. Amanda and Kent, a Canadian Llama, will get them to your door in no time at all. So 
uh, that's the place to get them at. And there's lots of other good things there, people. Fritz, um, yeah. <laughs> Myself, Ryan, Brian, Jan, others have influence on Ken. Poor guy spending his money for him, getting all these wild and crazy uh, uh, products in uh, for you. And the Daiichi hooks that we all love. Yeah. So I think again, this is probably a good. Yeah. I think this is probably yeah. a good segue. Aggie's got a question here. Um, do you use these offset beads on straight hooks, or also are on scud hooks? Aggie. I probably need to send you something for that. <laughs> it's a heck of a segue. Yes, you can. And that's the real benefit to me. When I saw these hooks, um, I, uh, you know, kind of obviously got excited. Oh, these, these have, these have potential because they're also for you people out there. Like, you know, when I'm not still water fishing, I love to fish rivers and streams and other things. And I love to European nymph. Um, so you can all also use these flies and just tie them on a standard hook um, flip the bead around. You don't necessarily have to have that concave uh, facing the front, and that'll cause the fly to roll upside down. And for European nymphs, that's a standard trait for them to roll upside down. So you can tie pertagons with them, uh, your check nymphs, all those style of, of flies, basically any fly you want. Again, the beauty in a river and stream situation is that fly is going to ride kind of this way through the current. Of course, it's going to bounce off obstructions, and you're just going to lose way less flies. I can't believe once I started using European nymphing techniques over 10 years ago, how little, uh, how, how, how the loss of mortality on my flies as opposed to standard hanging them under an indicator and hook, it seemed to hook everything else in, in the way. So, uh, yeah. Brian, what's, what's this one? I got to look at this one. Uh, Amazon Mr. Coffee w cup warmers that work great to keep hot water on your desk. Oh yeah. 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 Thermal cup would work well. Like, uh, the one here, I should let me know if anybody be interested in these things. I've got one sample and I never did anything with it. I've had it over a year and just feel it might be a bit too much to say, hey, people, buy a mug with my oh, God, people are wearing my shirt. So, <laughs> oh, you bugger. All right. So, Aggie, great question. So, the next fly I'm going to tie is uh, a favorite fly of mine. I've had it for many years. We sell it on uh, my and Brian's online store, the Pitching Leech. And uh, this was a fly that was pre-balanced. Um, I would, um, I'll just get things set up and I'll switch cameras over here. And this was the closest thing I had to a balanced fly. I would heavily weight the nose on it with a brass, a tungsten bead, and then stick um, lead, lead wire wraps underneath of it or non-toxic lead. Um, but uh, this has sort of solved the problem where I can get, again, these two-for-one flies that I can fish both under an indicator and under a, um, um, a um, what am I trying to say here, a uh, strike indicator and fish cast and retrieve. So I'm just going to dig out, um, I'll put a gold bead on this one. I've got a, going to put the one eighth bead. So the 3.5 millimeter, uh, everything works backwards on this camera. There we go. So I'm just going to put a gold bead on. Again, you could use any color you want. You could. I certainly like to use the hot colored beads, particularly the chartreuse and the uh, the hot orange. I've already talked to Kent about adding some hot pinks. Poor guy. <laughs> so again, I'm just going to put this bead on. And... We're so needy, aren't we, Phil? What? We're so needy, aren't we? Oh yeah, needy baby. It's only because we're paranoid. Yes, we are. Yeah, I got to admit, we are. Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure I got this bead orientated on properly. So see it on camera here. And again, the same thing with the bead sitting on, upside down right now. We'll use some olive thread because I'm going to tie an olive one. So I'll just grab my, just get that tying thread on there. Ooh, Amanda just jumped in from Canadian Llama. They have hot pink in stock. Get them while they last. Well, I guess I guess I'm placing an order tomorrow because I like the hot bead, hot pink beads as well. So I'm just covering that hook shank with thread again, and then we're going to go up, and I'm just going to make sure that bead rotates, and then just again I've just got my thumbnail very tight to the back of the bead, and just using the thread to run down the, my thumbnail and place those wraps. Anytime you want to drop thread in one spot, that's a a great way to do it, Even, you know, if you're putting a thread bump for a tail on a nymph or a dry fly uh, to help, um, you know, flay, spread out the tails and 
um, that's a great way to do it. So I've got this in place. This is a dead simple fly, which is another reason I like it. So the next step is I'm just going to tie in some uh, uh, marabou for a tail, a nice long flowing tail. Now I like in a perfect world, I like my marabou. Just a little segue on marabou here. Uh, most of the time, you get the strung marabou. It's literally uh, or blood quills, and that's because when the when it was still on the live bird. There was still blood going up the stem, and uh, that's why it's called a blood quill. But I like these mature feathers, these long select plumes, because I personally, I just like marabou that has lots of individual fibers on there. They're just great for tails. But, of course, you can't wind this on because that's how you determine. The thick stem on this plume identifies it as a mature plume, whereas a, a I don't have one handy, but a... Um, a, uh, a blood quill or strung marabou plume that's more spade-like in shape, shorter, um, would have uh, a very thin stem that you could actually wind on the hook. And, and uh, you know, this one it would be sort of like a blood quill. And then a lot of times um, there's just not enough bush on the fiber. You know, the fiber's not bushy enough. So we end up having to stroke the sort of the stroke it together along its length like so to even up and form a tail. And you could certainly do that. But if I had my preference... And it's not always easy to get decent marabou these days. I would strip it off the side. So I'm going to look for a this plume I kind of like. It's got the fibers are more or less the, the same length. There's a little bit of uh, drop off here at the base. So I'll just strip that away. And then right um, the sweet spots kind of on any feather is, is usually, I'll get this on frame, sorry. It's usually this section right in the middle here from sort of about a, the middle two thirds of the feather. So I'm just going to come in and, and maybe about a, just over a inch, inch and a quarter of the fibers. I'm just going to stroke them out. And then I'm, just like I did on the um, I'll pull back and over a bit, just like I did on that slap. And I'm going to pull off. I can only manage so much. So instead of trying to rip this off in one uh, strip where I could lose my grip and, and cause the, the fibers to become misaligned, I just literally roll them on what I have stripped onto what I haven't stripped. So I've, what I've done is as I rolled this, I folded it towards me, which would roll it down onto the part of the feather I haven't stripped off yet. And just do this in, in uh, a little application like that and strip off. And you, what you want is a, you got lots of static flying around here tonight, but you know, relatively even tips of the tail. This one hasn't turned out as good as I'd hoped, but she'll work. Hey, Phil. Yeah. Do you have a preference on your select marabou? The as hairline far, spirit river no i um with, with what we've got nowadays whatever packages i find um i go with right i i look through the bags i just don't grab the first one i see um i i definitely want to have a look and and make sure um that uh you know i like what i see in the bag right so i'm just uh, getting this sort of repositioned in my hand again so i've got this aligned up i'm gonna got static going everywhere tonight Opportunity Fishing's got a question here um, asking if it's a scud hook. Yes, it's a scud hook. I believe it's a Daiichi 1120. Yep. Right there. Um, and anyway. uh, you can you can balance it, um, but you need to use a clinch knot and then slide that clinch knot over towards the uh, the point of the hook. Yep. Um, so similar to what we talked about in Phil's first slide, but you actually can balance this. Yeah, we're going to show at the end of this. I'll show a version of this fly. Uh, you know, and the, the risk is you have a long tail. So there's a roughly a shank length. I got a few errant fibers I can sort of micro pinch the length. There's one, there's two, there's at least. That's a long tail. That's what I like on this fly. A light, long tail that's going to really pitch and undulate. So I'm just going to, what I've done is I've just trimmed off fibers flying everywhere here, almost right up behind the bead again, one loose wrap, two loose wraps. And then that's when I apply the thread tension and I don't take my hands off. I just sort of lift and continue to hold the materials together. When you lift uh, on the material, so they're under a bit of tension, not to breaking point. When you apply the thread wraps, they're just going to suck right down on top and not, uh, uh, roll around the hook on you, any material you want to do. So I'm going down into the bend a little bit, and then I'm just going to stand the the um, tail up a bit. If you wanted, you could, um, to reduce fouling risk on this, 
you could almost post that tail where you would pass the thread around like so a few times. So what I'm doing, I'm coming over the top, catching it with my left hand and flipping the bobbin around, not quite that aggressively up the tail, but just post it like you'd almost post a dry fly wing and see how that sticks up. That's going to be less resistant to fouling. Right, because once this gets wet, this is all going to move. And I can actually, Ryan, you think it'd be better if I pulled this out a bit? Or is it fine there? Does that look good? It's it's pretty it's pretty in focus. Okay. I mean, it's a long yeah. tail, but yeah, and you just and then there's a few tips. It's not real critical, but if you're, you know, you're a little worried about a few extra minor fibers sticking out longer than the rest, you're good. So I got that tail tied in, and then for the body, I'm just going to use another product you can get uh, from Kent, but. Uh, Lots of manufacturers, this sort of straggly stuff. This is called Brill. This is the uh, UV olive in the five millimeter. And I'm just going to take a length off of this, like so. And I'm just going to tie this in right at the base of the tail. Just secure that down. Bring my tying thread right up behind the bead. And then just... Start my first wraps right at the base of the tail and come up. And this has got quite a strong core. So I want to come in and just like I've done with the dubbing, I just want to sweep those fibers back because we want them to, to stand out. This is also a great material to use for a body on a scud. It doesn't get much easier. Just wind this up and put a bead on it. And, and, and you could make a scud like this. You could make a really take, if you consider this, what I'm tying with this fly, you, and when you see it, you could turn this into a scud really easy by tying in a very stubby short tail or no tail or just putting one of these beads on and making a body like this, whip finishing, and you're done. No need yeah, for actually, a, a, a guy we know, a guy we know well who just joined us on here, Rick Beck, he does a straggle shrimp that I'm pretty yep. sure of with a little scud back in a UV brill or a straggle string and yep. um, excellent pattern. Yeah, or you could just palmer a... Uh, a, um, you know, a, a, a real short undersize, maybe two extra, you know, this is not a size, uh, a, a, a drive, a saddle hackle that's size for a 10, but it's maybe a 14. So it gives you maybe a burnt orange and that's it. That's it's, it's almost like a, an English snatcher, um, which is just, and I've used English snatchers as scud patterns um, simply because with that hackle on there, you know, it's a non bead headed fly. The hackle is going to slow the descent of the fly. So when you cast, and this is a cat, that would be a cast and strip application where you're, you're stripping the fly back and just that, that hackle is going to keep it suspended off the bottom and out of, you know, when you're fish are in chasing scuds and less than five, six feet of water. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a little, you could probably whip finish and call this done, but just for a little contrast, I'm going to take, I love this stuff. This is whiting. Um, let's get it the right way up. Brahma hen. Come on. You got to remember everything works backwards for me here. This is the speckled model gray olive or olive speckled olive. Just a nice contrast on here. So I'm going to select a feather. Comes on a cape, which is nice. So the feathers don't get damaged. They sort of stay anytime you can get. I'm a big, I love buying whether it's pheasant rump or soft hackles on a, on a cape or a neck like this. Um, they just stay together and don't get all beat up in the packaging process. So I've stripped off a feather. Um, I kind of eyeballed it with the, you know, the fibers, individual fibers on the feather are going to be about uh, the same length as the shank. And I'm just going to strip off the flue off the base like so. And then I'm going to come in. And I might actually this side, because I'm going to tie it in so the, the, uh, it's going to sit like this on the fly with the most prominently marked or convex side of the feather facing forward. So this is what I call wet fly style. The, the fibers will want to flow back over the fly. So I'm just going to actually, I've stripped it off a little bit on right here because that first wrap is going to wrap on bare stem and not have hackles going everywhere. So right behind the bead, I'm just going to tie in this stem just like so. A couple of wraps in front and almost... If you stand it vertically, you can put a couple wraps right in behind too and kind of figure it in there. And that should be locked in pretty good until I go to grab it and it'll probably pull out on camera. And then I'm going to take my hackle pliers. And I don't just, I'm, whenever I'm, this is just a habit I've got into, 
is whenever I'm wrapping hackle, I don't, um, um, I just don't come in and grab the hackle. I want to make sure the feather's positioned properly. So I'll put a half a turn in it to make sure that that feather, just knock the bobbin out of the way, is going to wind. It's got, it doesn't have a twist in it. And I'll attach the hackle stem at this point. So I'm definitely confirmed that the feather is straight. The most prominently marked or convex side of the feather is here. The dull side or concave is this way. I'm going to come up and then I'm going to bring my my uh, four. I'm just going to pull the feather through my thumb and forefinger like so. And that'll train some of those fibers to go back. And you don't need a lot. You know, and, and thankfully the feather kind of self-governs because you really can't wind a lot. You don't want a lot of a real bushy um, collar on this because all the fibers are going to compete against each other. So I put a couple of wraps in there. And then I'm going to remove the hackle pliers. And then I'm going to, I haven't removed the tip yet. And I'm going to grab everything. I'm going to play with it a little bit. Eyeball it. Make sure everything's broke. These fibers, the wet flies, the little teeth on the feathers are going to want to grip and hold each other. So you can play with them a little bit. You want to make sure that they're dispersed as evenly as you can around the hook. They're not all combined to one side or the other. And then I'm just going to pull everything back. Thumb and forefinger to expose. A couple of wraps in here. You could, and then I'm now I'm going to grab. I've got tension. I'm pulling down on the bobbin. The bobbin is under tension. And then I grab that tip and I give one sharp pull. And the tip comes out. Breaks off nice and neat, like so. But you got to have that that bobbin under tension because if you just yank on the feather. There's a good chance that could bounce the fly in the vise, and then the uh, um, the feather could break, and then of course it pops out from underneath. So now we're just going to uh, give this fly again a touching. We don't want to mat down those fibers, so a little bit of uh, in this case UV resin, the, the uh, real thin stuff, or you could use super glue or nail polish or lacquer, whatever you like. Just wind that in a couple of times. Unbury your whip finisher. It's amazing how quickly my desk turns into a, looks like somebody blew up a chicken here. And just break that off. And you know what I forgot to do on the last fly was <laughs> cure it. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, it's back. I wonder what that is. So we just give that a little cure. Don't stare into the blue light. And she's good. And then we'll just, uh, you can take uh, your your dubbing brush or a to you know, an old toothbrush works and just kind of brush this around and that'll flow the fibers back and break them apart. And that's the pitching leech. And you can tie this, I tie it in all of, you know, it, it could pass as a damsel. It could obviously a leech. It's got lots of movement. This tail is long and gets flowing. I usually put some, a couple of strands of, uh, um, Flash in there. It could be flashaboo. I like flashaboo typically in a long marabou tail because it's supple and breathes and kind of complements the movement of the uh, the marabou. But the key thing with this is to, uh, and I can actually do this this way, Ryan. This might be better. There we go. Um, the way this sits like so, if I take, and I've got one already rigged up here to save time, so you've got this like this. So what are we talking about with this clinch knot? Well, I've got this um, tied on here already. And I will drop the vise out of the view. Right? I'm just going to push my vise down. And that is a scud hook with the head turner bead. Oop, go the right way, Phil. And that's just a clinch knot. So the, this is the beauty of these beads is when you tie them in. Again, the key is that the concave side of the bead is facing the front. So you get the mass of that bead out in front of the hook eye as much as you can. And that's going to, that's a long tailed fly that's going to tip horizontal. And then this is actually tied vertically. So I'm just going to come in here with my thumb and hold the fly and actually just give it a bit of a tug. And now you can see if I bring that in, eh, having trouble here with the camera. Um, I think you can see that, see how that, the tippet sort of coming off towards the bend of the hook, that really encourages it to hang horizontal. So that's that's the beauty of, of all of these is just the simplicity of it all. And just what a great, you know, again, we've got a fly here that I could just loop knot it and 
put it on a hover line or an intermediate or a type seven, cast it out, strip it. It's going to ride upside down. It's going to jig and undulate. You're going to have great action. Or if that's not working, I can just pick up my other rod, tie this on under an indicator and suspend it horizontally. So these two for one being lazy presentations are great. So I don't have to have, you know, two styles of fly, you know, a pitching leech with just a standard bead and then a pitching leech uh, with this bead, you get a two for one presentation out of this. A couple of questions here, Phil. Sure. EDB Outdoors asks uh, your preference on tail length. I know on this pitching leech, you purposely tie it about three times the length of the shank, but I think we're usually looking for about the length of the shank for our tails, but yeah, certain patterns call for different tails, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, this The pitching leech is literally, I wanted that long, um, that long uh, tail. So originally when I tied that fly, it was just on a scud hook with as much weight as I could concentrate at the eye of the hook just to get this fly to pitch and undulate. And of course that short shanked hook with that long tail, that long tail is really going to move and, and uh, move and flow. Right. So. Uh, and I think we've all experienced with longer tailed leeches or buggers or those kind of things. If you're, if you're getting short takes when you're out on the water, you can always pinch some of that marabou off on the lake. You know, yeah. that that's worked for me numerous times if you're getting short taked on those long tails. Yeah. Uh, what else do we got here? A couple of more questions. Uh, oh, Phil, I know I've done this in the past, but we got a question here from Phil. Um, you ever use that UV Briller, that straggle is a dubbing loop? You get a little more Absolutely. flash in there, yeah. a little more um, bulk? Yeah, particularly the longer, um, you can buy the, the Brill in a 5 and a 10 or 15. I can't remember. I know I should know that stuff. But a longer length. And I often will take that Brill and form a dubbing loop. So let's say the Brill I put in was a 4-inch section. I would form a dubbing loop that is 3 inches. And when I use this hook, so I would load the dubbing loop with my dubbing. And then I would pull the Brill down and come underneath this hook hold it horizontally and give it a spin like so, and then continue to spin. That will twist both the brill and the dubbing and the dubbing loop together and just keep spinning and spinning and spinning until those fibers start to radiate out 90 degrees. That's when you know you've got enough. Brush it out again and wind it forward. If you go on my YouTube channel and check out the Grizzly Sedge Pupa, that's exactly how I formed the body. I mix some brill with um, some semi seal, I believe I was using the peacock semi seal um, to make a caddis pupa, and then the thorax is made out of um, grizzly marabou. The actually the um, aftershaft feathers from a grizzly marabou plume, which grizzly marabou comes off a chicken, a regular marabou plume comes off a turkey. So grizzly marabou is smaller, and it's got those little nice secondary feathers that are ideal for still water flies. But you very brittle stems, so it's really a good idea to control them with a dubbing loop. One of the, I mean, I'm a big fan of dubbing loops. There's so many um, tech, so many things you can do with them um, to imp help with your fly tying. I love this question here, Phil. Is it possible to use too much UV material? Um, I think so at times. Um, you know, when I put, you know, um, a bead at the front. Um, or a, um, a little bit of UV flash in the tail. Like I maybe put two to four strands in a tail. That's it. It's a little UV highlight. And I'm not, I'm not, um, there's always lots of discussion on UV, but what I'm really trying for, what I like is the UV, the fluorescence, because um, fluorescent colors stand, stand out at depth, you know? So that's why we like to use those fluorescent colors when we're fishing blobs and boobies and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, here's a, an example here. I'll put this on and I'll switch cameras, but uh, as well, um, what we can use with, you know, what other things we can do with these beads. Um, and this is, you know, when we're using fluorescence like this, um, this is pure attraction. This is about, um, you know, for the most part, we are, you know, appealing to the trout's curio you know, curious nature, um, that kind of thing. So this is a jelly fritz um um, blob, a little bit of a uh, uh, crinkle mirror flash for the tail, and then one of the um, um, head turner beads, uh, again tied with that concave side uh, facing the hook eye, and this will suspend horizontally under an indicator as well. And I often use this fly as a dropper, so I will tie it on still with the clinch knot just to encourage that fly to hang out a little bit more horizontally as well. So um, this is where we would use the fluorescence. This might be a bit much, but we use this for attractors and also as a Daphnia cluster too. So you can certainly use 
um, this. So for the most part, I tried, if I'm using, if I'm tying imitative flies, I'm going to use it in a subtle uh, manner. But if I'm going pure attractor, it's going to look like this fly a bit like a street, you know, a Las Vegas street sign. <laughs> How about how about with the marabou, Phil? Do you uh, do you like the UV marabou? I find the feathers aren't quite as nice as some of the non UV stuff. But or what's your preference? Uh, it came out for a while, and and I've got some of it, and I had some some good colors in it. That uh, it definitely whatever they did to it, it does fluoresce a bit. It's the fluorescence I like. Um, you know, I do some bloodworm um, with some UV red marabou for the fluorescence. Um, because we fish bloodworm generally deeper because they, you know, though they can live everywhere, they really love those uh, muddy bottoms that are common to the deeper areas of the lake, you know, 15, 18, 20 feet where the sunlight penetration uh, isn't reaching and the weeds aren't growing because there's no sunlight to stimulate weed growth through photosynthesis, that kind of thing. But uh, I'm usually just, I find a color I like and, and try to buy three bags of it <laughs> because... You may, uh, as most people know, dye lots come and they go. So I saw another good comment here that I liked. Um, I guarantee carp would take that fly, re referring to the pitching leech. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of these flies I tie, they're not just trout flies. I fish, you know, I get to travel. I'm fortunate enough to travel a fair bit, uh, especially when the show seasons are back, you know, they're ramping up again for 2022. So if I can, I try and, uh, you know, explore some of the uh, local waters in the areas I'm speaking and, uh, you know, bass, um, carp, all that kind of stuff. And carp are one incredibly fun fish on a fly rod. So we had a quick question here about head cement, Phil. I know uh, we both like the UV resins yeah. more, I think, than the head cement or the, the super glues. We also use the yeah. super glues, but. Yeah, I and those are the two I prefer because and I think it's important. Most head cement is a lacquer, like uh, nail polish is a lacquer. It's a coating. Whereas head cement, I mean, sorry, the uh, super glue or, um, you know, these UV resins, because you cure them, they adhere. They're an adhesive and a protective. And so they're actually gluing stuff down. You know, UV resin is a, an epoxy substitute. So um, that's that's how it came to be, because mixing epoxy, you know, it's, you, can, you know, it's not the most. Well, most of the adhesives we use are not good for us in general, um, but um you know, and it just takes time to mix and cure and it's fussy and fidgety. You know, you got to like a material you just put on them, you know, whatever you're using for and hit it with a light and it's done or with super glue, it dries in seconds and, and it's good and it's glued it. So that's why for years I used to use, you know, lacquer based um, head cements, but I've totally gone either super glue or brushable UV resin, the really thin stuff. Uh, Cole here. Uh, thanks, Cole. Uh, thanks for joining in. Um, it's okay to join late. Uh, yes, once this, um, uh, and we finished recording, uh, finished doing this, we've got a few minutes left here. We'll answer as many questions as, as we uh, as we can. Um, this will be left uh, recorded and will be on both my Facebook uh, page and my YouTube channel. So it will be there. So. Um... Great quote. Great quote, Keith. Um, I'll have you know, Keith, I used this quote in my uh, new book um, when I talked about, um, you know, trout sampling flies out of curiosity. I used your line. Um, I quote you all the time with that because it's such, if you, if anybody out there is a parent, we all know about this one, right? As soon as you turn their back, there's something in their mouth they shouldn't have. <laughs> There's a good question here from Michael O'Reilly about where we get our fritz from. And I just actually posted in the comment section the website for Canadian Llama. Yeah. Uh, you can get the jelly fritz that Phil and I use um, that we tie our blobs and other flies with, uh, fabs and blobs yeah. and boobies uh, at CanadianLlama.com. And you can also get these tungsten head turner beads that we're showcasing here tonight. Um, we did hear from Amanda and Kent earlier in the in the show that they've actually added some new colors, hot pinks, olives, um, some reds as a recently just showed up today. So uh, get them while they last. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, th they're very uh, just great people. You know, if you've got colors or sizes you want, you can reach out and ask them. And if there's enough of demand um, their history has been, they've been very gracious about adding that if it's possible to do it. So, uh, as, as Ryan said, they carry a range of materials, including the Daiichi hooks I was using tonight, the Fritzes, all that stuff that Ryan mentioned, uh, really, uh, really good there. So, 
So, yeah, any other questions, uh, Ryan? I don't see anything. We got one asking. Uh, Thank you, Brian. Our favorite, blob, uh, our favorite blob color, I think, is probably prawn. Uh, yes. I don't know about you, but yeah, uh, that's hard, prawn. hard to beat that prawn color or the blaze orange. Or I think those yeah. are some of our go-tos. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the prawn color uh, here, either in the jelly fritz or... Um, Sorry, I'll get this view right. The jelly fritz or the um, um, slush jelly are the two um, the two types I like. It the, the slush jelly like this when it gets vet vet when it gets wet uh, is, is incredibly vibrant. Um, sorry, this is very translucent, and then the slush jelly, which is kind of a blend of a softer um, chenille like um, material and the jelly fritz, it really becomes vibrant and really pops. Um, so yeah, and I see a. Uh, uh, this is real. This is really nice, Phil from Stephen Dexter. Once again, come to expect oh. the best in time tutorials. Uh, you never disappoint, and has purchased from Kent for years, and always a pleasure. So, we're not Thanks. the only ones. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, we're not. Uh, we're just trying to show. This is where we found these beads and these products, and it's nice to have a one-stop shop. So, uh, um, yeah, and I think Amanda popped on here. Or there's the color. Oh, we got yellow too. Matt Olive, enticed anodized red, so that's going to really stay on there. Olive and blue, so you could certainly tie that baby leech with a blue head too, um, because Absolutely. blue is one of those last colors to disappear in the color spectrum uh, depth. If you remember the analogy, Roy G. Biv, that's the range of colors: so red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, and uh, violet or purple. Um, so th that's. Uh, those those uh, purples and blues are uh, great colors to to have on. And I think that's part of the reason that uh, that bruised color works so well. So, all right. Oh, that's a great. Uh, that's good too. But olive is a great um, daphnia or zooplankton um, color because so many zooplankton uh, species out there, including daphnia or water fleas, are olive in coloration. So. Olive, you know, a lot of times a small olive leech will work as well as, as a blob because they just see that clump of color and, and take it down. So uh, we saw that last week in the throat yeah. pump, didn't we, Phil? A bunch of olive daphnia yep. in the in the trout. So yeah. What does Ethan want? He's got a question up here. I went out and fished with uh, Ethan uh, just north of me. We went up to a local lake, and uh, he just he was out there with me. He filmed it and he put it on his YouTube channel. So if you look up Ethan's channel at EDB Outdoors, you can see me there, um, half frozen, looking like I'm warm. <laughs> uh, but we had a good day. We got rainbows, browns. The elusive tiger uh, escaped us, but uh, you know me, Ryan. I'm happy catching rainbows all day long. So yeah, you and me both, buddy. Yeah. So, uh, oh, good question. Uh, if you could find open water, <laughs> that's the $64,000 question right now. Yeah, where, um, where are you going, Brent? Yeah, yeah, Brent, tell us where you're going. <laughs> um, yeah, because if it's within, I don't know, six hours. Um, but what I would try, my favorite combination is typically um, – a mini, a micro leech or a baby leech on the bottom, like that uh, uh, baby leech in the bruise color, or the uh, Todd Oshie's vampire leech with a chartreuse bead has been working really well for me in that number 12 jig hook, and then a blob of some sort above it. Uh, and again, in Alberta, we are legal to fish multiple flies. I know that's not always the case. I know for our friends and colleagues in British Columbia, they can only fish single fly, but they can fish two rods. So um yeah so uh, that's how i would do it and it's a deadly combination and just the i think the key is when the water temperatures are in the low 40s you just got to let it sit keep your cast you're going to fish under an indicator because for two reasons uh, first of all stripping a wet line after a while when it's you know just above zero your fingers are numb and uh fishing's no fun when you can't feel your hands and you're constantly trying to warm your hands up even if you got hand warmers and just because the water temperatures are so slow, the trout's metabolism is so low um, that they just really will, are not really kind of hesitant to chase anything. They just things hang there. So you want to keep that that um, indicator close because your takes are often really subtle. Like 
indicator slides to the left, doesn't even go under, it just sort of slides across the surface an inch or two. It just looks, that looks different. So you want to hit it or it goes half down. Um, a lot of times you're not going to get the classic foomph indicators gone under, um, which often occurs on a leach when the water temperature is up because it's a bigger food source. So it'll expend more energy to eat it. Um, so you want to keep it close. If you bomb your cast out way too far, um, you're just simply um, not going to be able to see or react to those takes. So, Yeah, some of the takes we had last week in that cold water, Phil, I mean, I even downsized the size of my indicator. Yeah, that's you know, a great. The, the downsize, the, downsize the size of your indicator to what you can get away with because, I, I mean, it's it's sometimes you're questioning whether you saw it move or not, yeah. and it's a take, and, and there's a four or five pound rainbow on the fly below it. So, yeah, I, I, I think generally, uh, that's a great tip, Ryan, because I generally, the smallest indicator I can get away with, you know, when you're using a heavier tungsten fly or the wind is up or a combination of those things, you got to use a bigger um, indicator because. Um, you got to be able to see it in the chop and the weight of the fly. I'll pull that indicator almost flush with the surface, which makes takes really hard to see. But the smaller it is, the more sensitive it is, and the closer you'll tend to keep it because if you pitch it way out there, you can't see it. So it's kind of a you got to bring it in closer so you can keep an eye on it. So, yeah. So, well, we just hit an hour, one hour and one minute. I want to thank, first of all, everybody who took to take time out of their Thursday evenings. I know we were conflicting with other club meetings, Thursday night football. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if the Oilers are playing tonight. They played last night. Uh, my Bruins played tonight. I think they won. Um, so yeah, lots of sports on to watch at this time. So again, thanks for uh, coming out to watch again. This will be recorded. It'll will be as soon as we hang up here, it will be available uh, a few minutes later on my Facebook page and my YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel, you're going to see other videos. You're going to see the pitching leech, how I originally tied it. You'll see the baby leech on there. Um, that grizzly sedge pupa we mentioned. Um, some of the blobs we tie as well. I'll be doing adding additional flies. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. It really helps the channel out and it helps me continue to, to grow it and uh, build content. I'm, I'm trying to get to, I'm just almost 11,000 subscribers. So I'd like to, to flash through that threshold and get higher. Um, by all means, please, um, sorry if this was a little advertorial like it wasn't our intention, but we're just Brian and I are just so fired up about these beads and and what a great um, application they are and how versatile they are. Uh, all the different things to do because couldn't balance a scud hook before. Now you can or a standard shank hook. Now you can and get a kind of a two for one fly out of it. Um, and we're going to do other talk and tie, you know, now that uh, our for Ryan and I, our open water season is toast. <laughs> pretty well um it's back behind the bench so i'll be doing uh both talk and tie and lake talk live events if you've not seen one of those that's where we bring guests on or ryan and i'll perhaps talk about a subject and, and have a q a uh, something like that so we'll have guests on in the past we've had brian chan on a couple of times jordan olerick todd oshi talking about um lock style techniques uh, andrew humphreys we talked about sounders so Again, if you've got anything you want to see, fly pattern styles, fly tying techniques, still water techniques, you'd like more exploration, more in-depth discussion, please let us know. We're always looking for more content to do. And uh, leave any comments you have, uh, leave any other comments you have in the uh, comments in both either YouTube or Facebook, and I'll get to them and we'll answer them for you. So again, thanks everyone for coming. Ryan, anything else? I rambled there forever and ever. No, uh, you know, this is, uh, it's all about the viewers here and we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. And I, I know like me, I'm sure that you guys learned something as well. So yeah, thanks from all over the world um, yeah. for join from joining us and make sure you like and subscribe Phil's YouTube channel. There's, there's a ton of knowledge on there if you haven't already. And thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> go Bruins go. All right, everybody. Enjoy. Uh, the rest of your evening, have a great weekend, get behind the bench and uh, yeah, post your, your tungsten. If you get some of these beads, post your patterns in the comments uh, in there and we can have a look at them. And uh, if you're willing to part with them, um, um, happy on there. Oh, walleye on the flies. Definitely would. I would do it. Yeah. I love to catch walleye on the fly. That's what gets yeah, me. Phil, Phil and I, Phil and I filmed a vlog a couple of years ago. Uh, you can check it out. You can find it on his YouTube channel where we have some really good luck with balanced no, flies can't. under. I haven't, I haven't finished one off yet. <laughs> oh, it's not up yet. 
It's not up yet, but it's in the pile. There's a lot to, to get through. So, but definitely uh, would love to do one on that. Um, yeah, would happy to do that. I wasn't always sure people are interested in that, but uh, definitely we can do that. So, and take care, everyone. We'll see you soon on the next broadcast.